Today, we are very happy to have Levon Pogosian visiting us. He is um, a professor and chair of the physics department at the Simon Fraser University. And um, he has done a lot of work on cosmology and you know, deriving fundamental physics from the CMB, uh, also from uh, testing dark energy and modified gravity theory models, uh, as well as just uh, 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 a very nice work on uh, explaining the H naught tension using primordial B fields, from which he uh, was a recipient of the Buchalter Cosmology Prize in 2021, which is a prize for cosmological research that's hoping to uh, encourage uh, basically groundbreaking work in cosmology that uh, helps us understand more about the universe. So we are really excited that he's actually going to tell us exactly about that today. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jana. Really nice to be here. Uh, I, don't, I was here a very long time ago last time, so it's really nice to be back after almost 20 years. And uh, just about that book out the prize, I just want to let you know that is a prize given to a paper, not to a person. So any of you can copy paste an archive number into a field and forget about it. And then a committee would <laughs> decide. Okay? There is no uh, CV, no nomination, nothing. It's given to a paper. So it's a it's a nice surprise if you get it. And there are three prizes. Uh, so so for postdocs, you know, if you know about it, 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 some people just are not aware of it. I do. <laughs> okay. So um, I my this is the title of my talk, and so it has. Two topics and then a uh, merger of two topics. And I decided to build it as first talk to talk a little bit about the Hubble tension. Should I stand? Is it a good place to stand? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, a bit about the Hubble tension, at least the aspects of it that are relevant to this talk. And then a very short review on magnetic fields and then tell you about how the uh, magnetic fields may help or may help with the Hubble tension. And I, I didn't uh, want to try to anticipate all the different questions because there are lots of questions you may have about any of this. Right? There's a lot of physics sitting in here. So uh, I assume that I'll try to say the bare minimum that is required for you to understand what I'm talking about. But please take a note of your questions and either ask me during the talk or after the talk on any of the aspects that I would skip over. So, I think I need to click here. There we go. So, the Hubble tension, as you know, I'm sure, is a tension primarily between the measurement of H0 done using CP calibrated supernovae, which is more of a direct measurement looking at recession of galaxies. And the H naught that we extract from CMB by filling our cosmological model. And if you look carefully at these two columns, you would quickly appreciate that the tension is between measurements that use a model to compute the sound horizon of recombination, one way or another, and those that don't. And different types of measurements have different uncertainties. Some are quite big of these uncertainties, but the grouping here is clearly divided between these two types of models. And so that hints at a possible connection between the Hubble tension and the missing ingredient in the physics of recombination. And a lot of people have looked at things that may have happened either during or before recombination. So uh, we need to review quickly how you get the value of H0 from CMB. So I'm sure you've seen these nice peaks in the CMB spectrum. The characteristic uh, scale, this is an angular spectrum, so the characteristic scale or the positions of these peaks are given by the sound horizon. In, in actual real CMB maps, if you stack hot and cold spots, you actually see circles. And the radius of that circle would be determined by the co-moving sound horizon uh, at the time of the combination. You can also get that in a distribution of galaxies, and that's known as baryon acoustic oscillation. <coughs> so the same scale is imprinted in both. And 
if you um, if you can get the sound horizon somehow from your model, then the distance to that redshift, whether it's a combination or BAO, tells you about the Hubble constant. I'll tell you more about that. And generally, a smaller sound horizon would require a smaller distance and a larger Hubble constant. So by making the sound horizon smaller, you can increase the value of H dot that you get out of the CMB and BAO. Okay. Now, CMB is nice because you can actually measure everything you need to know in your cosmological model from one measurement from the CMB. Okay, so from the spectrum alone, and we also have polarization spectrum, but just from the temperature, you have just enough information to actually measure the H0. And there are four parameters that you need to measure. The radiation density, physical radiation density, which you know from the CMB temperature, uh, metal density, baryon density, and the value of H. And there is all these different bits of the spectrum tell you something about each of these four numbers. So, you know, CMB temperature we know. Then there's something known as the early ISW effect, which tells you the ratio between metal to radiation density, so you can get a handle on the metal density. The relative heights of the peaks give you a handle on the baryon density. And then uh, you have the angular peak theta, which is the fourth piece of information. From these four things together, you get all of these parameters, including H0, just all of it from CMB. And it's a very, very precise measurement, 67 something plus minus 0.5. So the uncertainty is sub percent, sub percent level on the H. <coughs> so um, just a few words on this, uh, a bit more detail on this. So I mentioned that you need to find the sound horizon and the distance to recombination. So the sound horizon, at the, this is the <coughs> moving sound horizon at recombination, depends on the speed of sound and the H between Big Bang and the recombination. And so if you want to make the sound horizon smaller, you could consider changing the speed of sound, you could change the H, which is what early dark energy does, and or you could make the Z star bigger. In other words, reduce the, uh, the domain of the integration. You integrate up to a, an earlier time or up to a higher edge. So the model I will be talking about, the primordial magnetic fields, achieve reduction of the sound horizon by making Z star larger. The combination completes sooner. Okay? And this is just uh, to show that H, what, what, what's, what's important here are actual physical densities. Okay? Because CMB is sensitive to physical densities, such as little omegas. And this is how H appears. And at early times, way before dark energy, so we're talking about evaluation of sound horizon, this is radiation era and just the beginning of meta era, this H, little h, is irrelevant. It's completely dominated. Everything is dominated by radiation and meta. So H doesn't play a role in a determination of the sound horizon, okay? as far as CMB is concerned. Uh, but it does play a role in a determination of the distance to the sound horizon. And then you, to find the Z star or the redshift at which recombination uh, took place, you need a model such as RecFast, and there are some other models that are much better these days, but they are parts of standard cosmological codes where, as part of the cosmological model, you compute recombination, the ionized fraction as a function of redshift, and use that to compute Z star and eventually R star and everything else in your model. And so the point I was making earlier is that the two different types of measurements are those that use that model, build that code to compute the recombination, and those that don't. That's the difference between the two types of measurements. So the BAO is different from CMB that it, it cannot constrain all these parameters on its own. BAO by itself, so this is the simplest BAO measurement. It's again an angular scale, so inverse angle beta, it's just the transverse uh, BAO scale, which is sound. It's now a slightly different number. It's not the sound horizon at recombination, but more like the drag. Uh, it's the baryon decoupling scale as opposed to the photon decoupling, but they're very close and related uh, very uh, robustly in most models. Uh, 
and this is the co-moving distance. So again, you measure a similar angular scale, but BAO doesn't give you a handle on all the other parameters, uh, unless you use some outside information. So BAO can only constrain a product of this uh, drugs based on decoupling scale times A <coughs> and omega meta. So you can see that having BAO measurements at many redshifts, you could constrain this to parameters, and that's kind of a band you get in a RD H0 plane. So BAO has this degeneracy line, and the, the, or the, the parameter across this diagonally would be the RD times H. That's the one thing that measures. So to get the H0 from BAO, you can do a number of things. You can use RD from CMB as an input. That's one possibility to break this degeneracy. You can use the value of the baryon density from the DBN and the model of recombination together, and again, uh, find the value of each node. And this, again, gives you a number that's very close to what you get from CMD. Or you can try to do something like combine BAO with galaxy lensing or CMD lensing, or a pro some other way of getting the physical meta density. And again, that helps you break the degeneracy. And you can get a value of H0. And all of this has been done. Uh, but what's important here for the point I'm trying to make is that each measurement of a PAO, I mean, a measurement at each redshift, defines a line in a RDH0 plane. So if you take this measurement of the BAO uh, and treat this uh, sound horizon, sorry, baryon decoupling horizon, RD, as a free parameter. Let's just treat it as a number and not worry where it came from or any sort of model that, you, uh, that may predict it. So take RD as a free parameter. Then for any given physical meta density, each measurement of PAO gives you a line in a RD H plane. So if you look at this equation, it has uh, three numbers, RD, H, and theta. So if you measure theta, it defines a line in the R, R, D, H plane. And at it, every redshift, the slope of that line is different. In fact, in a consistent model, all these lines should intersect at the same point for a given omega meta, small omega meta. Okay? So that's the same thing, just uh, shown in a slightly different way. So again, for a given meta density parameter, physical meta density, each VO measurements uh, defines a line. And CNV angular scale is another line. In fact, what's shown here by red is the uh, BOO scale from CMB. <coughs> so that's the RTH line from CMB. This is where Planck measurement sits. Okay. So if you, and then here are two just sample lines from some other BOO points from EBOS. So for example, at redshift 0.5, you have this line, and at redshift 1.5, you have this line, and they are they all at the same physical meta density. Okay, so for consistency, we just pick the same meta density. So ideally, if your model was so consistent, all of these lines should intersect at the same point. Right? And that's a very nice way, actually, a great consistency test you can do with the AO. Uh, and the reason we don't say there is a tension is because there are uncertainties around these lines for the BAO especially, and hence you get this blue band, and so everything is consistent. But the point is that if you want to solve the Hubble tension by reducing the sound horizon, you move the up, up the red line right, for CMB. But if you do that, you very quickly exit the blue band, so you run into tension with the BAO. And so the only way you can avoid that is by increasing the physical meta density. So you can choose a larger meta density and the CMB line, all the lines move to the left. And then for a, for a physical meta density, which is quite substantially larger than what you get from Planck, 1.167 instead of 0.143, you can actually make BAO, CMB, and I guess shoes all match up and achieve resolution of Hubble tension.
but that requires a significantly higher physical matter density, which tends to increase the sigma tension or just increase the SA parameter. And that's, uh, that's why, for example, in early dark energy models, uh, you, you can't sort of do it just with that. You need, you need to invent additional ingredients to avoid this. Okay, so uh, at this point, I gave this review of the Hubble tension with the aim to say, first of all, it appears that if you were to take up the Hubble tension seriously and not just think in a sense as a theoretical problem and not a problem with the measurement, then it hints at the missing ingredient in, a, in either something that happened prior to recombination or during recombination. And by itself, if you really wanted to fully solve the Hubble tension, it may not be enough. So if it's really 73 and it's 67, it won't go all the way because you won't be able to match the DA and C and D at the same time. Uh, but it appears to be an unnecessary ingredient. And so there are a lot of models. And one model I'll be talking about, which is not invented to solve the Hubble tension, but happens to help, is that of primordial magnetic fields. In fact, it's not a model. Uh, it, as I said, we didn't create something new. It was something that was primordial magnetic field. It's a 70-year-old subject, and there's a lot of work that was done on it. So we just took what uh, what uh, primordial magnetic field could be and see what what's, what may happen. Okay. Okay. So uh, that was the first part. Quick introduction to Hubble tension. Now even quicker introduction into primordial magnetic fields, which is a much bigger topic and older. So uh, there is a lot of uh, data available uh, that. Uh, that shows existence of, prim of, of not primordial, or astrophysical magnetic fields in all kinds of clustered environments. So from planets to stars, to galaxies, to clusters of galaxies, to filaments, and some say even voids. And so with the galaxies, I'm sure you know that pretty much every galaxy where a measurement was possible <coughs> was found to have a magnetic field of around micro level, and that concerns spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, old galaxies, young galaxies, they all have a micro field. And uh, the traditional view on and their origin of it is that they were produced using a dynamo. For example, the Milky Way would turn about 40 times. And in order to generate the magnetic field we have in the Milky Way, there would need to be a seed, but that seed would be very tiny and could be plausibly produced by through an astrophysical mechanism, such as a Birman battery or some other motion of plasma uh, at galaxy, early stages of galaxy formation. There is a bit of a problem with higher range of galaxies, where we see the same level of magnetic field, it's the same micro -gauss. But the galaxy that's so young, it haven't had a chance to turn more than a couple of times. The question is, where did the seed for that come from? Again, it doesn't mean you need a primordial magnetic field. It just needs a different type of dynamo. So it, there are papers that say that the turbulent dynamo is a different, so different mechanism. Again, astrophysical. Or you could say, which is the basically original ideas dating back to Fred Hoyle where this primordial idea started coming uh, from, but that uh, maybe the field was there to start with, in which case it would be already in the plasma prior to galaxy formation. So it just collapse with the gravitational collapse, and then when magnetic field lines would sort of compress and form the magnetic, seed the magnetic field in all the collapse structures. Uh, to, if you wanted to explain the Milky Way magnetic field, purely through primordial mechanism and not dynamo, you would need around 0.01 to 0.1 nanogauss of, uh, of commuting magnetic field strength in the early universe. Okay? And that would have to be on around 1 kiloparsec to 10 kiloparsec scales. There are magnetic fields seen more recently, actually very cool measurements by LOFA. So they first saw in back two years ago synchrotron emission from two merging clusters and uh, suggesting a 0.1 to 0.3 microgas fields. Uh, there is also Faraday rotation measures that are 
extracted from filaments, suggesting 0 0.01, 0 0.1 microgas fields. Doesn't have to be primordial, but the authors uh, in these papers, they try to do simulations to model origination of such emission in their systems, in filaments, and uh, in merging clusters, and models that fit their observation the best are the primordial models. So, so far they haven't come up with a model that would be based on an astrophysical way of generating these fields that can explain their observations. It doesn't mean there isn't one. Did, did they get any information on uh, uh, spatial clustering along the filament, which I think is a little more difficult to do because that would be an indication of whether it was uh, flowing out as a wind in roots or whether it was actually sitting there in front of your way in the, uh, in the gas and filament. I don't know. I mean, this is this is yeah. Big, this is a big challenge, a very important thing yeah. to do, and we're keen about it here, which is uh, in terms of the gas distribution and hot gas along the filaments, how much could have been inside and then outside? Issue and it's probably an important issue here. Uh, so I, I, I agree, and uh, I don't know what went into the models. So they have some models that they use to model the generation of the field that led to the observed rotation measures. So they somehow, I guess, put some initial conditions, some ingredients like the structures of the filaments, and I, I don't know the answer to your question. I can imagine it's quite difficult to, to think of uh, all the ingredients that you need in such simulations. But you can probably set up an okay yeah. simulation to see how it actually works. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems is a cross-link of field lines, which can lead to, I think, recombination, which is a complexity. But we won't get into that here. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, like, yeah. So, uh, and then there, uh, claims that there is this, uh, I mean, it's not a claim, it's a fact of life that there, there is a deficit of uh, GV gamma ray halos around TV blazars. And the one that, the explanation of that proposed some while ago, now like 14 years ago, was that that could be because this TV blazar photons, they produce electron positron pairs and basically cascade down. Uh, electron positron pairs produce themselves, they uh, produce uh, uh, upscatter of the photons, so that eventually the energy cascades down until you get this electron positron pairs in GeV range, and then the magnetic fields, if they were in the voids, would diverge the trajectories of electrons and positrons, and uh, while you would expect to see some GeV gamma rays due to upscattering of CMP photons by this electron positron pairs, you don't. Uh, the counter argument to that, that there may be uh, plasma instability that could be responsible for the fact that uh, this uh, energy is lost. Basically, there, there is a deficit of energy. So the cooling rates uh, due to plasma instability may be faster than due to cascading. So it's an open question. There are debates on both sides. But whatever. That's, some people take this as evidence of magnetic field, even a lower bound on the magnetic field in voids. Now, uh, there is also a talk about connection to the early universe, I'll say about it in a minute, but it's not a question of whether magnetic fields were generated in the early universe or not, but a question of uh, how much and whether it would be relevant today. Okay, so there is, a, there is some level of it produced, no question. And so this is a very brief review of the stochastic primordial magnetic field that I will need to talk about recombination. So we assume that it's some, uh, there's a process in the early universe that generated uh, primordial magnetic field, which is stochastic. So it's not some uniform field that's uh, like a magnet or something. It's stochastic, so it's locally, uh, it could point in random directions locally, and it's, it's magnetic field that are highly tangled in plasma. Uh, there are interesting links to biogenesis and the physics of the electronic phase transition that are very, very interesting and intriguing. And in that way, if you find evidence for primordial magnetic fields, 
it is a window into their universe. So there are reasons to look at it just for that. Um, once magnetic fields have been produced in a highly conducting plasma, they will stay there because they remain frozen in. Magnetic field lines remain frozen in plasma, and they would scale with the expansion of the universe like radiation. So they would, the magnetic field strength would go down as A squared. So, so this is yeah. what we mean by large scales in this context? Like, what, what does large scales actually mean in this? Context? So, large scales would be larger than the diffusion scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so as long as you can treat it as perfectly conducting, you, you think of it as a large scale. And you describe them using statistical methods, so like a power spectrum. Or this is the Fourier transform of the B field. So it's a vector, which is a function of Fourier mode, and it has two parts, which is like this a parity even and a parity odd parts. Uh, mostly people talk about the parity even part, but parity odd part is responsible for the helicity in the magnetic field, and it's very important. Um, and people normally take it to be a power law, and there are predictions for what this power law should be, depending on whether the magnetic field was produced in a phase transition or through some uh, inflationary type generation. So if it's produced in a phase transition, this exponent is 2, which corresponds to the Bachelor spectrum. So it's on a large scale, it's a fall off. And so the, on smaller scales, you have a peak, and then correlations fall off on larger scales. And the peak is determined by the uh, what they call integral scale. That's where the usually the cascading happens from smaller scales to larger scales. And then at some scales, magnetic fields just dissipate, and there's a sharp cutoff where there is nothing, no power at very small scales. Now, there are inflationary ideas. So inflation by itself doesn't generate magnetic fields because of the conformal invariance of the electromagnetism. But there are ways to break the conformal invariance by coupling the on some, uh, to the electromagnetism or coupling gravity to electromagnetism. There are various ways. And you could get a scale invariant prime module magnetic field. This is a summary of current observational bounds on cosmological magnetic fields. So on a on a x-axis is the length scale. Think of it as like a wavelength or Fourier mode lambda. In, in parsecs, kiloparsecs, and on a vertical scale is the magnetic field strength. So B lambda would be something like a representative strength in the magnetic field over a certain distance scale, or a Fourier mode of a magnetic field at that Fourier number. So you have some upper bounds from BBN that's mostly due to uh, contribution of magnetic fields to the general radiation density mm -hmm. at the time. Then you have CMB anisotropies, they generally constrain magnetic field strengths to be below nanogauss or around nanogauss. Far their rotation of CMB. Um, then you have this data from Blazars, which if you take, if you ignore the possibility of plasma instabilities, would imply upper bounds. Sorry, lower bounds. Okay. Uh, and then what's shown here is a magnetic field you would need to produce the magnetic field of our own galaxy from purely primordial sources. So if you didn't want to use dynamo, you would need a magnetic field of around like 0.01 nanogauss at around kiloparsec scale, and that would do the job. Uh, and of course, that applies to other old galaxies like ours. This um, dotted line is the distribution of magnetic field strength from, for, some, for a scale invariant magnetic field spectrum. So as the name suggests, it's flat along the scale. And if it's a phase transition origin, then it would be a line like this from the electroweak phase. Okay? And you see that, uh, so this, you could get magnetic fields uh, to generate galaxy both ways. Okay. Right. Yes? Good. For um, the phase transition, is that also an upper bound? Be the line? Or? So the line, okay, I should say that, thank you for responding. So the, the, neither the inflationary nor the phase, electronic phase transition lines have known amplitudes. So they, they, the, the amplitude is unknown. We don't have a theory of inflationary magnetogenesis <coughs> or 
a fixed theory of electroweak mechanisms. Okay? These are generic predictions, but the amplitude is unknown. And so they are calibrated so that they both give the same uh, number here, but otherwise they could be up and down. Okay, good. So now I'm to the final uh, part of my talk, which is putting this two together. Uh, so, how do the magnetic fields help the Hubble tension? I'll first say it in words and then go to equations. So, in words, magnetic fields are inhomogeneous because we're talking about in, uh, stochastic magnetic fields. So, the magnetic energy, magnetic energy density is inhomogeneous and it will push baryons in regions of lower, two regions of lower magnetic density. I'll show you the equation in a minute. So therefore, creating inhomogeneity in baryon distribution. And that would, uh, and any, any inhomogeneous recombination completes soon. It enhances the recombination rate. And that helps to reduce the sound horizon, that helps to be the Hubble tension. So the relevant equation here is the earlier equation. And the key thing to appreciate is that, so in the early universe, you have a very tightly coupled plasma, electrons and photons form a tightly coupled fluid. The speed of sound is big, it's one third, very close to the speed of light. Right? And so no uh, significant inhomogeneities are can develop in that environment because they are caused by the photon pressure. But as the universe starts to recombine, on scales below the photon we have, ions are no longer tightly coupled, they behave as a viscous compressible gas. And that's the scales that are relevant. So for L less than photon in path, L gamma, speed of sound is tiny. And on those scales, the pressure drops to a very small, drops to a small number. This is the pressure term. Now the other relevant terms are the basically drag force. There's still some photons on the scales, uh, residual photons, which dump the motion of your baryons. And the Lorentz force, which has this gradient of this web, which is responsible for pushing baryons to regions of lower magnetic field density. So that's the Lorentz force. Okay. And so the plasma develops density fluctuations on small scales, and by small, I mean kilopascal. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And so the, there is a back of an envelope estimate that was done by my collaborator, Karsten Damzik and Tom Abel, back in 11, 2011, and they estimate this baryon density in homogeneities to be of order one, because they cannot be uh, they cannot be much bigger than that because magnetic field dissipates quite quickly as it spends energy on uh, clumping the baryons, so it cannot push them to lower density. Okay, and then once you have this in homogeneities, you look at your the combination rate equation, this is the Me is the fraction, is the number density of three electrons. And so you have a quadratic term on the right hand side that facilitates the combination. It's n squared because you have n of protons and n of electrons, so therefore they're equal, and so they uh, n squared. And then you have the opposing uh, real, like actual recombination, meaning uh, deionization due to the Lyman alpha photons eating hydrogen, ionizing it again, and that keeps going, but on average, things sort of move towards neutral hydrogen. Can I just ask a yes, question? Sir. The computation of the uh, surviving density fluctuations on a person scale, uh, presumably it's in deep competition with viscous damping. So, what actually emerges? Viscous damping of uh, the variance. Um, I'm not sure what you hope for in terms of emergence. I, what, I don't have any. Hope, yeah, I just yeah. don't actually know the answer off the top of my head. But my first reaction would be that there would be a lot of viscous damping uh, of you know, things that are created. Not that it would make a steady state or anything like that, but that that would cause the magnitudes to go down, and it would be really interesting to see what those spectra are that emerge. 
So we, we now start getting actual numerical results from MHD simulation. So this question should be in, in actually the recombination regime. Yes. Yeah, I'll show you some pictures. This is not my work, but work of Hidamzik and Abel. Uh, so that's in progress. Or there's a paper out, actually. But what is the source of viscosity? Photon drive. Photon drive. Yeah. That is completely photon drive. Yeah, uh, so what emerges are pictures and what, how you turn it into a spectrum and what you well, expect to see. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so here you have an n squared, and basically, if, if you have uh, n that is inhomogeneous, then average of n squared is always bigger than square of average. And that's why you get an enhancement in a quadratic term that drives recombination. And that's a known fact for any inhomogeneous recombination. It's in a book by Jim Peebles, uh, so it's a known fact. And that's what Idamzik and Abel pointed out 13 years ago, uh, way before the Hubble tension, and these are plots of ionized fraction, and they show the effect that indeed ionization happens sooner. <coughs> and this is the impact on CMB peaks they shift to a smaller angular scale, as you would expect, with a smaller south horizon. Your C there is like, means clumping factors? Yeah, C is for clumping, yeah. And they used a, a toy model, I'll, I'll tell you later. Okay, so this was the toy model implementation. It's based on a very basic uh, partition of your space into three zones of three different baryon densities with certain fraction that's a fraction of space with high baryon density, a fraction of space with medium baryon density, a fraction of space with low, and uh, you average, ensemble average over these three zones. And there is, uh, so there, is, there are two ingredients in that toy model. One is a fixed shape of the probability distribution function for the baryons, and uh, basically assigning of the weights to different regions. And this baryon clumping parameter, it's even though it looks like yeah, it's, it's the variance essentially in the variable number, uh, but the PDF is not Gaussian, so you, the shape is not Gaussian. Yeah. So it's not the only parameter you need. And so uh, what happened was just before COVID, uh, I kind of pushed Karsten into looking at this in the context of the Hubble tension, and uh, it took some time to convince him because he was actually retiring mostly from physics and, uh, you know. But we got together and worked on this during COVID, and that was, that made COVID go really fast, because we were really excited about this. <laughs> to our surprise, we thought, okay, you do move to sound horizon, but it's really hard for a model to actually produce a decent CMB feed. CMB has a lot of information, the tiny error bar, so it's not enough to just move to sound horizon. A lot of other things have to fit. Okay, and that's we don't know at the time. And it, so far we had the toy model, and we put the toy model in, and we got decent fit. So if you, we took the Planck with our M1 model, which is the same model as uh, Carson and Tom used in 2011, and we found that Planck by itself doesn't uh, prefer clumping, but it opens a nice degeneracy direction with H0. And so, <coughs> Some clumping could be a decent fit. That was the conclusion. And so if you give your CMB a little push with a prior on H node, it gives you a detection of clumping. So this is a Planck plus H node prior from something like shoes. So it moves your contour uh, for H node in a, where is my H node here? Yeah, so it moves it to a higher value. And actually the nice thing that I liked at the time was that the width of the Gaussian doesn't change by a lot. You don't go from an uncertainty of 0.5 to something like 1.5, which a lot of the other solutions to the Hubble tension do. It, it actually moves h naught. You don't lose a lot of accuracy in a determination of h naught, And you get a detection of clumping. Okay. So your four sigma or five sigma tension h naught turns into something like three and a half detection of clumping. Uh, this was our toy model fit at the time. Once you add the BAO data, you cannot achieve very high values of H0, like I said. 
And this is what it does with the S8H0 combination. It moves it somewhere here, which is a very decent place to be. Uh, All right. So, and it happens that the magnitude of clumping that would be required to solve the Hubble tension is, fits here. So net, there are lots of things to get excited about, right? If you're sitting in your apartment or house during COVID, uh, that looked really exciting, and it's still very exciting. I'm, I'm actually very excited about it. Because, we're, we're yeah. To, uh, yeah. No, you don't. Clumping is quite blind. No, but so that I'll even the Milky Way I mean, or are you just assuming well you've got a small scale magnetic field that gets amplified and somehow that represents the Milky Way? So you know, so to to I mean, the form the magnetic field kiloparsec scale, right? So that one's measuring. But you're talking about clumping on when you allow the gravitational flaps on yeah. much smaller scales than that, right? Yeah, so let me first uh, clarify this square. Yeah. So that's the magnetic field you would need to, <coughs> to, to generate the Milky Way magnetic field without time. And it could doesn't have to be at kiloparsec, it could be any way here, as long as it also has oh, sure. strength on kiloparsec. It's, yeah. It could be larger scale. Yeah, it could be as long as it has the same power on kilo. Yeah. yeah. And um, this line it kind of, yeah, it's calibrated so that it meets the requirement here. Yeah. So that this, this line could have been no, but up and down. What I'm asking yeah. is that there is a characteristic scale and a combination in which the pumping is most effective. Yes. If you were to take that scale and collapse it into the Milky Way, and then ask, what is that physical scale after the collapse? It would be smaller than the kiloparsec. So, in other yeah. words, the magnetic modes that are doing the work, move H non, are surely different than the magnetic modes that are most effectively seeding the Milky Way. Yeah, uh, that's right. That's right. So, uh, uh, Yeah, so I mean, it, it doesn't yeah. sound like this necessarily. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, right, but that this is a very interesting thing to think about. So it would, maybe I'm thinking in the wrong direction. I'm thinking after the magnetic field did its work to create the barrier of clumping, would right. there still be magnetic field strength on the parts of cell to also see? Sure. Uh, galaxy later, would it feel erased? Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It depends on what else is there. And you have to also appreciate that the peak of the magnetic field spectrum keeps moving to larger scales. So while it was at one kiloparsec of the combination, that peak through inverse cascading or direct cascading or any dissipation right, would move to larger scales. And so by the time of galaxy formation, it could, could have been... Uh, it would also kind of get weaker. So, so. It would also be weaker, yeah. yeah. And so that's, uh, yeah, so and, and that's, it is what it is, yeah. Can I just uh, follow sure. on this for a second? Uh, maybe I don't know. Um, given uh, delta n squared, does that mean that delta p squared or some kind of impact on the magnetic field. Are the homogeneities a bad reaction? Bad reaction? Is, it, is it balancing or is it completely under, well, it's not going to be completely on the data, but I think it's a nonlinear effect where magnetic field uh, it dissipates as it generates this in homogeneities. So it produced the clumping and then uh, some say this clumping uh, may see the other things wrong, but magnetic field dissipates. Basically, passively unwind, yeah. so we can act in. Yeah, it's all the, the, the gravitational class. I just wondering right. whether it be squared over the line or something. Is it characteristic? Or what you say? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, they, yeah. So, um, okay. So, one thing that emerged from uh, our toy model studies was the importance of the silk dumping pedal, that the same models that gave a decent bit to plant predicted deficit of silk dumping, meaning more anisotropies than in a standard lab CDM. And so, because of this, ACT and SPT actually provided tighter constraints on the toy model. So when we added uh, ACT and SPT, in fact, ACT and SPT were in, in, in tension with each other on this issue, as well as, you know, there is a bit of tension, or was, between SPT and Planck. But SPT actually liked the magnetic field model and ACT didn't, and because they had different uh, some some differences uh, traces to uh, some calibration issue maybe I don't so uh, I want to talk about the next steps of what's happening now so what were the takeaways from the toy model first of all uh, we can only solve the H dot problem up to 70 which may be okay that the amount of magnetic field you need are in a nano gauss range co-moving and silk dumping could be very important for confirming or ruling out these models. Then, of course, uh, this model, the toy model, was quite primitive. It's, an, it's a choice of a probability distribution function that Carson and Holmes thought of. They thought that was the most plausible thing at the time. It turned out to be quite wrong, as I'll show you. The things we see from simulations now are very different. And also, it assumed that that PDF is fixed. While, of course, that would evolve through time, so both magnetic field and baryon density change through recombination. And it did not account for the peculiar velocities and Lyman alpha transport. So, all of that is part of the simulations. And so, it was key, clear that before we talk about this more, we need to actually do the due diligence and uh, do MHD simulations and get recombinations in this direction. And so this is not done by me, but I talk to Karsten weekly. And so uh, while I am not an MHD person, uh, I try to learn as much as I can, but it's done by mostly by Karsten. Tom uh, is co one of the co-developers of Enzo and also participates in that. And they have a paper out, but I should say that paper will require some corrections. And so this version is good for understanding what the simulation is like. Uh, the ultimate results will be slightly don't go have to be slightly different. Um, so what what they did was uh, what, what Carson is doing is taking uh, Enzo and adding this additional photon drag term and uh, running it, and then so it, and then he simultaneously in parallel solves this uh, recombination rate equation, which he calls the chemical solver. And so it's in it's a coupled system of equations where you get the baryon density evolution from the MHD code, use it in the chemical solver, get the ionized fraction, feed it back into MHD, and so you get that both both in real time. Uh, he did additional work to include the effect of Lyman alpha photons uh, in the simulation, and uh, what transpired out of it was that uh, the the fact that Lyman alpha photons tra travel from, let's say, under dense regions to over dense regions. This, this transport across uh, many scales, many one kiloparsec zones, is important. We, we call it uh, Lyman alpha mixing. Okay? So that actually is, uh, uh, in, in fact, in some way, it was helpful uh, to fit the CMB data bit. Uh, and then uh, it, there's not much freedom in the choice of initial conditions here. We decided we'll consider four primordial magnetic field scenarios. A phase transition source, a batch or spectrum, with and without helicity, and the scale invariant spectrum <coughs> with and without helicity. Okay, so four cases, and so far we only had time for Karsten, I say we, but I mean Karsten, just we discuss him a lot uh, with him. Uh, so, so far, we have, he has simulations for the bachelor spectrum without the distance. 
blue means it's steeply rising as you go to higher Fourier modes, as opposed to red, which is decreasing. And scale invariant is flat. Okay. So these are the kind of pictures you get from the from from the simulation. So this is a 24 kiloparsec box with initial uh, magnetic field strength of 0.5 nanogauss for a non helical batch or spectrum. Uh, so on the left, just to be sure, so this is the projected magnetic energy, so the other one is the baryon. So this is the magnetic energy density, and this is the uh, actual baryon energy density. So what you can see here, you see there are these black regions. This is where baryon is clumped early on into high density regions. And uh, actually, the, the, the solar cannot resolve this after a while. And rather than going to adaptive mesh, uh, Karsten realized that actually for getting the recombination rate, it doesn't matter. So you, the, the ionization histories that he gets are robust to whether you resolve the high over densities in variance or not, which kind of makes sense once it sucks up all the ionized, all, all the electron densities around. It sort of doesn't matter what happens in there. All you care about is the effect on the average, and that won't change with higher resolution. How large are the meshes here? So, to, this is 256 cube. Oh. Not that large, I guess. But yeah. uh, we're working with. A bit worried for a blue spectrum as well. Uh, he's got a certain number of modes that they, he tests uh, that is, are sufficient to get. It's a compromise. He tries to keep the variance yeah. uh, low while man keeping it computationally manageable. We we did get a, a, a grant from uh, Compute Canada, so uh, we're using that on Cedar, uh, but it's not a huge uh, allocation, and so yeah, it's a compromise. But so he's he got some results that are trustworthy. They sort of converge. Yeah. Um, I didn't fully understand. So sure. I understand, you know, you're uh, using a, a modified Epsilon, great thing. Um, how are you coupling it to the rest of the transport of the photons and transports? Are so you feeding back one to the other? Or are, you, so, or are you actually doing a homogeneous transport? So I don't do it. So, first of all, yeah, I'm talking about uh, Carson. Right. So, yeah, so he's got the chemical solver, that this equation, uh, this one, yeah, is solved simultaneously with, uh, with the MHD solver, which is uh, determining the magnitude of the, mag the magnetic field and the baryon distribution, and they solve in, in tandem. So you get the ionized fraction at every step, thinking back. Now Lyman alpha part is uh, slightly more tricky. What he did was uh, did some additional simulations of it using the toy model. I got some estimate and it feeds it back into the chemical solar. So Lyman alpha parts come into here. So it is. There is a bit of magic uh, involved. I don't so know if that. During the, during the combination, yeah, the all phase speed is going way up. Uh, yes, the magnetic field strength drops down. Yes. And so qualitatively, do you see some very transient, I don't know, shock like behavior um, associated with that? Um, it basically, it's frozen and then you unfreeze it. Um, yeah. You mean there would be sudden, yes. as, as guess, sudden so release of yes. dynamical kind of yes. release? Yes. There would be a lot yes. of motion. Yeah. I, he, might, he, he, he should be seeing that in, in this. This is an honest simulation through that. Yeah, yeah. He simulates from before through, through after. And he does see a drop in the magnetic field. So, yeah. 
So this is, uh, for example, uh, what he gets for the Bayer density distribution. This is the probability of a given uh, baryon density contrast. Okay, and you see this is evolution with redshift. The probability distribution evolves. I'm, I'm, I don't want to go through every line here. Here is a slightly different quantity. It's multiplied by delta. So rather than probability of u bayon in a region of given baryon density, this is a probability of finding a baryon at a given point. Okay, but the point here is that this is the toy model, this is the three zone model, which was three more, and this is the actual distribution at uh, at the peak of the clumping at redshift 1500. It's one time slice, but all of it evolves in time, and it shows how different the reality is from the initial assumption. So it's delta yeah. would be an average density, or what's delta there? So what is what the delta? Oh, sorry. Delta is the delta rho baryon of a rho baryon. It's the perturbation, dimensionless perturbation of baryon density. Yeah. Okay. So um, does the over density of the magnetic the over density of the magnetic field does it trace the same kind of probability distribution function? Um, doesn't, uh, I'm not sure if they plot that. They have some estimates of, yeah, I didn't bring that here. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I can. So that's also an important question. So I, I, in my talk, I, I'm not talking about what happens to the magnetic field. So they have two stories going on in the paper. What happens to the baryons? What happens to recombination history? And what happens to the magnetic field? Because of course, it's important to know what magnetic field is left afterwards so that you can look for it at low redshift observations. So, and they actually, answering these three different questions requires three different types of simulations. Because one, because of the constraint on the computational resources, depending on which question you want to answer, you run it at different resolutions. Yeah. And get, uh, so it's, it's quite complex. So actually, sorry, I yeah. had parts on the in my head. Yeah. At recombination, post recombination, what's the ratio of the alkane speed in these points to the gas sound speed? It's close, very close. Uh, so it's, so I think alkane uh, speed is slightly lower. So in that ratio that I showed, you know, they were about the same order, but ratio was less than one. At which point? Because CS squared is going to go to this radical change. Yeah, so. At which point? Uh, I mean, at the point, the, uh, let's say. Squared, well, I, I, yeah. I, I, I was just taking the gas sounds. Yeah, so this is at the. Yeah, higher. but higher up is uh, short. No, no small like, scales just care about the gas sounds. Is that true? Well, I mean, closer. Yeah, I know, once you're well away from it, you know, there's an extended drag, even though the, you know, the electron abundance is like zero point five times, it's still got a, an impact on the three hundred percent So I think the back of the envelope estimate was at the time of maximum clumping, so at the peak of the effect. The, what happens in actual simulations. I think they do have plots of it. I just didn't bring them here. So, uh, yeah, so this is the ionized plot of the relative ionized fraction. By that, I mean the difference from lambda CDM. If you take the output of standard breakfast, breakfast is the standard recombination code used, or uh, now there are others, but anyway, lambda CDM recombination is the Subtract it from what is uh, in a simulation and look at fractional change. So this would be like 15%. This would be 20%. Okay. So this is the dashed line was the prediction from the toy model, Zon model. And these are the kind of curves they get from the simulations. And you may think, okay, they are similar, but 
the fact that it drops down quicker is quite significant. It makes all the difference for the silt dumping curve. Okay? And this is the line that looks most robust at the moment. So no, these lines are likely to be wrong. They are from the paper. But this one is the closest to what, and that's what I've used to run some preliminary fits. So I couldn't resist sharing some excitement with you, even though it's unpublished and very preliminary and simulations are still happening. Okay. So I took the latest uh, plant likelihood. This is PR4. I, I used the Hewlett Popham lollipop. Uh, I also used, uh, separately run the the PR4, uh, uh, was it uh, Commander? That, which one was the, uh, George, George and Steve Brad and which one? Yeah, anyway, well, it doesn't matter. But from Hilly Pop and Lolly Pop, Capspec? This is yeah. This is Hilly Pop, this is not Capspec. So uh, this is the amplitude of the clumping. This is just an arbitrary scaling of that ionization history. And remember, it will evolve with redshift. So in a realistic scenario, it would be slightly different. Uh, sorry, forget about it. Uh, forget what that is. Anyway, so what we find is quite intriguingly that, and then it's something that I need to figure out once we have final ionization histories from simulations. But so far, it looks like you get a better chi-square for CMB at the high value of h naught. Not a lot better. The helipop chi-square is something like 35,000. And you improve it by something like 3 with an h at an h naught of 71. Okay, but for some reason, Kobaya doesn't find it. Uh, Kobaya is the Cosmo MC, sorry, is the MCMC uh, code that runs these chains. So without the prior on H0, <coughs> it doesn't find that. It, it just uh, spreads. So without the H0, it just spreads the H0 distribution. But if you give it a target, if you put the prior on H0, it finds a peak, which is this, and it actually has a lower CMP chi square. So something to do with the way Kobai searches, or anyway, this is very preliminary, so I don't want to uh, focus too much. This may change. We may end up having a worse sky square in the end. But at the moment, it looks good. And that seal dumping pale anomaly disappeared. So there is no issue with that anymore. And that's because the simulations predicted a very different PDF. OK, so I'm back uh, almost. Finish, sorry for going over time. So this is a very falsifiable proposal. Eventually we'll have all the results from the MHD simulations. We will either confirm or rule out this as a possibility for the Hubble tension. If, we, if it doesn't help with the Hubble tension, this will provide the tightest constraint on primordial magnetic fields from CMD. Any other known measures such as anisotropies, party rotation, etc. don't come close to this. this is, it's going to be much more stringent. If we detect clumping in CMB, that gives you a well-defined target, aside from being an amazing discovery. I, I mean, it will need to be confirmed, but it will be quite exciting. And it will give you a well-defined target for other things to look. Uh, aside from higher resolution experiments looking for the starting <coughs> the finer details, you could look for, impact, uh, for some signatures in the spectral distortions. The cosmological recombination radiation is a known spectral distortion. It can introduce wiggles in the black body spectrum that you can look for from recombination. But adding this magnetic field modification to recombination history introduces a change in that on top. And that's been looked at by Jens Schlube and others mm -hmm. recently. They claim that can be detected. Then you have the mu and y type distortions that were known for a while. And if you have a magnetic field at this level to reduce the Hubble tension, you would also see mu and y type distortions in the, in the CMB. Uh, then, if you're very lucky and you have a scale invariant spectrum, 
at the peak magnetic field that is allowed, like 0.1 nanograms, you may see it in the Faraday rotation measures through so mode coupling correlations of CMB. And then, uh, like I said, this uh, lasers, gamma ray astronomy, uh, once all these plasma instabilities are understood, could be, again, a very interesting probe, especially if you have a specific target to look for, if you know what the magnetic field strength is. And you would... Then, of course, you have all the radio astronomy with the rotation measures from distant radio sources, uh, and uh, that can also give you a handle on magnetic fields in the voids. And then <coughs> there are claims that this Cabernet clumping, this is also work motivated by our paper, they would produce induced clustering of dark matter. I remember Dick asking about that once I gave a talk, you asked, but would, would <coughs> induced clustering of dark matter? Uh, and I said that the impact is likely very gentle, uh, but somebody looked at it. They claimed there could be dark matter mini halos that would be triggered by homogeneity and variants at that time. Uh, I don't know much about how. I'm not an expert on how detectable that would be. Do you know what the scale is? 10 to the 3 solar mass halos. Oh, okay. Oh, so between like 0.1 to 10 to the 3. So it's a range. <clears throat> yeah. And so in conclusion, like I said, uh, there is a hint in this tension that there is a missing ingredient in the combination. and. Uh, Primordial magnetic field could be the, that missing ingredient. <coughs> it can only raise the H0 to 70. It may be all we need. Who knows what will, how the measurements will evolve with uh, CPs and TRGB and other ways of calibrating supernovae. And I want to again repeat that this model was not invented. It's actual electromagnetism with just the assumption that there was a magnetic field. This mechanism is not very sensitive to the details of the magnetic fields in their behaviors. There may be fine changes depending on what initial our spectrum is, but it's quite robust to what it is. And there'll be a lot of different ways to test it if it turns out to be a detection. Thank you. Much that wonderful lot. So, how do you explain the model change that you can find measurements of DAR? Uh, I, um, right, so they will not change. If, so if the DAR are perfectly consistent with Planck, Lambda CDM model, then the statement will not change. You could still push it to about 69, 70. Okay? Uh, so, like I said, there's this degeneracy in the BAO, and it's just a matter of uh, trying to find, put a counter somewhere where you can be satisfying both bands, the CMB band and the BAO band. Uh, but B BAO can provide a very interesting consistency test. And that's another work that I did, I didn't mention. But if you take all the different BAO measurements, like I said, all the lines need to be intersected at one point. And if you assume a particular, if you put a prior on the physical method density, you can get a measurement of H0. So you can do a consistency test. You can say, if I take a method density from Planck and use it in the BAO, without any other thing. Does it give me the same H0 as Planck? And that you can do with DAISY with sub percent accuracy. You can get an H0 from DAISY with a prior from Planck with a smaller uncertainty on H0 than Planck. And that's an interesting consistency test. So far, when we do it with the current data, we get an H0 of 59 and a half, but with the biggest spread. It will be really interesting to see what Daisy BAO predicts from that. But it's, there's uh, a lot of interesting things you can learn from BAO. Also, if you combine it with like future CMB lensing, that would be another independent way of measuring the H0. Uh, independent from recombination. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned that the clumping 
isn't really a function of the underlying power spectrum of the magnetic field, which is very surprising to me. It's not a strong function. So one is, of them is a blue field and one of them is a red field, right? So how can... how can Like say blue versus scale invariant. Red oh. is difficult. Oh. Red is not uh, possible. Really. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just based on causality, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Um, so it's mostly what matters here uh, uh, is how much strength you have in one kiloparsec and a few surrounding Fourier modes, right? Yeah, yeah. And computationally, it is much harder to work with the scale invariant field because you, you have to resolve many more, include many more modes that may be relevant. Blue spectrum is easier because a lot of the larger modes are not relevant. Yeah. yeah. But, but doesn't that itself set a clumping scale, just the fact that you have this? Well, since the clumping scale is essentially what is the photon free path as things recombine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's the scale on which variants are allowed to clump. Mm -hmm. And it happens that the effect is strongest at one kiloparsec scale. Other questions? <laughs> I have one comment. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, so um, when you mentioned the, uh, in the image simulations that you have to cut off uh, some clamping from the resolution because it's not needed, um, you were saying, I know. I mean, they, well, they, yeah. they say that it was the dark spots <coughs> in the images. Well, the dark spots were mapped as lower density at the at oh, the Okay. Uh, yeah. but I think they, yeah, they cannot resolve the own something. So um, I don't know how they mark. Uh, and um, when you were talking about a tree zone model? I guess it's a void. Yeah, they, I guess they mark it as a black hole. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Um, tree zone. Yeah, I didn't catch that what the zones were. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they call it zones. I guess they, they think of the inhomogeneous uh, the homogeneity, let's say three fractions, three, three uh, possibilities for every point in space. So you can, every point in space could be either a density one, density two, or density three. And there is a weight assigned to each density. Yeah. And this is going back to weight yeah. being on the first slide when you had the HC equation. But it had H in it on the right side. Yeah. I didn't catch that. So, like, which H is that? It had H zero at some point, or the little H yeah. is the H zero, but divided by one hundred kilometers per second per megahertz. Ah, uh, it's the it's the dimensionless. It's, H H it's yeah. the same thing, that's just true. dimensionless. Any other uh, when when you question? Uh, you mentioned the PDF and how important the tails are in this. People in the audience, tails are everything. Right? <laughs> uh, has that been well calculated? I mean, you can get them from the uh, distribution, you know, the maps that you make with these uh, answer simulations. Uh, to the extent, is there a really big tail? Because that's extremely interesting. Well, on many different fronts, not just from the point of view of uh, modifying the combination, but if anything can survive, then an interesting tail could do interesting things. Maybe it wasn't a question I asked you a long time ago, but I can't Maybe. Uh, but that it could then uh, be an interesting seed for modified developments of the first generation of objects. I don't know. Well, we'll chat about it. Yeah. So I am saying. I, I mean, oh, yeah, the tails can be. You're thinking of tails in the Bayon distribution, but uh, probability of there will be some probability of seeding yeah. early structure yeah, so formation. You might get some yeah. uh, extreme excursions yeah. uh, that would be interesting to check out. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this mini halo, would that? Well, it's a question of how long and do uh, if you build in and Delta NE over NE by this mechanism. Does it survive? There's a uh, effectively a, uh, uh, a well, of course, it recombines and all of that, but it's still got a fluctuation. 
Uh, anyway, it's a question for another day, perhaps. Uh, do we have a question yeah. online? Yeah. From Hamsa, maybe? Hamsa had her hand. Hi, Levon. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk uh, and uh, for the reference to your paper. Um, I was just wondering, uh, probably this was already covered, but would this have implications for 21 centimeter? At, uh, because uh, you are having differences in scenarios out to redshift um, 500 and potentially 10. And um, I mean, there are definitely searches uh, which might be going after such uh, such redshifts, but uh, there's also, I can see the scatter in your models due to Lyman alpha. So is there anything which uh, um, we can say about that? Uh, no, I, I haven't thought about the 21 centimeter. Um, so, yeah, so the, the remaining ionized fraction would be slightly different and i don't know if that's what you are referring to uh, but there, you know when it's already quite low there would be some very very tiny uh, changes whether after uh, at, at which is relevant to 21 centimeter uh, then of, or i don't know if you're referring to the impact of magnetic fields on observations of 21 centimeter because there would be magnetic fields presumably left uh, at as well. Yeah, I think that one may, may be smaller. Actually, I was yeah, more referring that, to, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, to your uh, this uh, this uh, this evolution of the ionized fraction. So uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I don't know how how strong it is, but yeah, I thought uh, the, the, there are differences. Uh, they are irrelevant for CMB. Uh, we, we did look at that. Uh, so anything that happens after like after redshift two hundred one hundred has no impact on anything in CMB, but for 21 centimeter, we haven't looked at it, but yeah. Well, Great, thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, we have desserts, so come up there um, to chat more with him. So I looked up the paper that Carl's on with the same Carlson. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it says they use Monte Carlo simulations for the for the Lyman Alpha. Yeah. Hi. Say Elmer. Yes. Yeah. So you do it separately. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And then feed yeah. it. Oh, yeah, you're it controls the ionization. Yeah, so that was the leak out of the clump is normally the smooth, it's going to run back in. I mean, when it's in the clump, then photons get out. Yeah, it's just seeing the and maybe a little bit of a bolt. That would be good. Then I can show you the expression. After all, we don't get to see each other that often. This is a celebratory. Uh, okay, so these are what uh, we'll find out. Uh, and Veer may not be coming because he was sick. So it's only Eric, Nate, and Siobhan, and you. Okay, I'll see if. Uh, and uh, you're meeting. You're meeting all of you at five p.m. on the fourteenth floor. Five. Why five? Why five? Well, that was just what the five was the, by default. So we're going to have an Shivan. early one, huh? Uh, Siobhan is uh, vegan, huh? Okay, well that's a constraint, but that's okay. Um, great. Okay. I'll see if I can uh, yeah. pull the odd other person in. Hey Tom. So don't worry, there. No so we now have one more ad. I'm going to be coming now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we bang my head against the wall. <laughs> Very nice thought. Thank you. It's such a difficult process. Yeah. Mine is pushing out of my comfort zone. 
<laughs> you have to cover all these things so, uh, with a lot of reference and stuff that people ask you stuff from the website. Yeah, like, yeah. Chances are somebody is an expert. Yes. Okay.